All right. Everybody get something to eat, something to drink, feeling refreshed. Wow, that was a resounding yes. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, we go back, well, probably five or six years now, right? He's the CEO and founder of an architecture and design firm in Los Angeles called the MRAD, and he'll be talking about how to brand digital spaces. Matthew. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Bob. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Matthew Rosenberg, CEO of MRAD Architecture. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, I'll give you a little background as to what the firm is and why an architecture firm is here at all at a mobile disruptors talk, and hopefully it makes some sense. Uh, so yes, I have an architecture firm, and we do everything outside of architecture as well almost at this point. We do uh, site sourcing, we do zoning analysis, we do some real estate development. So we actually try to find opportunities to enhance cities and enhance urban developments as well. Uh, we also do underwriting, so basically everything pre-architecture. Uh, we also do capital sourcing, so we raise money around these projects that we're working on and branding. And then on the back side of the architecture, we also do full interior design and product development, anything that goes into understanding what your experience is in that space, including uh, integrated marketing and then trying to understand the occupant and the user at the end of the day and how these uh, decisions and these products and all of these designs are actually being used and if they are actually making a difference. So we do pre-architecture, post-architecture, and then of course we do architecture as well. And we ask this question, can one subtle shift actually change our perspective and fix the business of architecture, which is really what I've set out to do. There's a lot of inefficiencies in the industry and that's why we're trying to extend the scope and reduce these inefficiencies. So an architect named uh, Peter Sampton in the 1970s redesigned the New York City classroom. And this slide is probably relevant to everyone in the room and in every industry. It's one subtle shift that allowed teachers to engage with students at a much higher level just by shifting these two blocks of the space. And so yes, it is working. These are some of our current and past clients that we're working with. I started the company six years ago yesterday and we have companies like Lendlease, Blue Bottle, Ring, Amazon, um, some big names out there, which probably most of you know some of them, and then some smaller ones. We actually help brand and build up tech companies as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about how an architecture firm can get involved in that. So we're gonna talk about branding your digital space today, which is a little bit about the digital space, but more about taking it back to the physical environment and how important that is to actually understand uh, which takes you back to branding your product and your business. So not like Wally, -E, but more so about actually engaging people through ideas about communication and actually getting them to do things that we want them to do, because that's why we're here, really. That's what connects architecture in the physical environment to the digital environment, is getting people to do things, whether it be buy a product, whether it be rent a room at our hotel, all of these things are getting people to actually take action. So this was a concept in a collaboration with Fast Company we did a few years ago, thinking about what the future of San Francisco might look like. Today, some of these things aren't so crazy. Three years ago, they were pretty crazy, actually. Um, you know, helicopters on your head that would take you from one place to another hasn't happened yet, but I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it will. So part of the marketing aspect is we actually place our building in our studio at the storefront. So we allow people to connect with us at the street level. And this is gonna be a recurring theme in the next 10 minutes of the talk is basically, how do we engage people at a very physical, hands-on place? Because the screen is one thing and connecting with people on the screen is a way to convert sales, but there's a background to this that people will engage with your brand at a much higher level on the screen if we can engage with them in the physical space. And so we try to invite them in, we showcase our feature products and furniture, we allow anybody to come in the space and engage with what we're working on. We host events, with, this one had over 300 people, we bring in other tech companies, other industries to try to talk about what the future of mobility is, what the future of VR is, any future of food and architecture, any kind of collaboration that we can invite people in and start a dialogue. 
And so this then gets into trying to understand how people are operating through our cities and how they're operating at the level of retail and the storefront. So there's certain ways that we're tracking how many people go in each store, Disney, Forever 21, how many trucks and Amazon trucks are driving by, and all this data is now being recorded, but what use is it is if we don't connect with people at a very personal level in terms of branding? And so all of this comes back to, again, you know, is retail dying? Are malls going away? And no, they're not at all. It's actually probably going to be a huge opportunity, I think, in terms of retail right now because of the experience level that we have to create and the branding that happens at that surface level. You know, Sterling and I had a talk with another girl from Postmates, actually, uh, a couple months ago, I guess. And she was talking a lot about, you know, their engagement on the mobile level. How do you connect with people there? And I'm not even sure she realized, but they have these pop-ups, you know, with milk in LA that's just opened up this, uh, I think it's like an ice cream store. They have physical pop-ups so that they bring people in and so people can connect on a physical way with Postmates because that enhances their brand connection when someone goes to the app and remembers an experience. There's a memory there. There's a sense of touch and smell and sight, and all of that is a memory sense that lays on top of your brand recognition of that product. And that's the importance of what I'm trying to get at today. So is there such thing as a customer journey? For sure there is, and I think we all, we all believe in that. And we control that, right? Whether we allow people to touch that product or we make people stay away from it. There's an interaction with things that we control both on the mobile level but a physical level as well that we have to take into account. And so getting now into how we actually start building out brands, we build out websites, their name, their logo, and try to understand how the architecture, the logo, the brand, the colors, the products, all of these lay into one another so that when we're designing something, yes, we design all of those things, but we also design a fragrance for those things so that we tap every single memory sense of that to enhance that brand so that when they leave that physical space and they go to your digital platform, there's a layer of memory that keeps adding on to that. Whether it be materials, spaces, logos, colors, all of these things go into that. This is a, a product that we worked with a couple years ago called Lumia. We renamed, rebranded them. They were called the Crated at one point. It's basically a technology company that fits within your clothes. So we set them up with a manufacturer in Canada actually where the technology is embedded in the clothing so you can charge your phone, you can heat the clothing. Um, they're starting to take off now, but they have a digital platform, but they had no sense of brand. They had, no one knew who they were. The Created was a super confusing name, so we looked into the history of sewing and looms and actually laid on this history into the brand of that product, which is incredibly useful because when you're telling a story about your brand, the name is actually very catchy or it's very confusing usually one or the other. And so now they've started to add marketing and we actually built out their whole marketing package for them as well so that you actually see someone on the street and now it's a recognizable name. This is a project we worked on and this is getting back to the user experience and how we actually start controlling that uh, with Tony Shea of Zappos when he bought 42 properties in downtown Las Vegas that he tried to build out essentially a new city. Uh, sort of went bust in the last couple years but this was a project we worked on at the start of that, which was looking at how we interact with people, how you create live-work environments, and how you actually create these collision opportunities, which ultimately are opportunities for innovation and discussion. So we actually created an algorithm of distance between a live, work, a live unit and a work unit that each person had in that building, so that there's a certain distance between those things that, people, that will promote people to move between them more frequently, but not so far away that they actually won't move between them during the day. So we want them to go home for a coffee so that there's more interaction in that communal space. And product concept and probably will never get built, but the story is there. This is for Equinox Hotels actually, looking at how we can engage with uh, the city from the hallway. So if we all go into the hotel, you get up to your 17th floor and the hallway and the the movement from the elevator to your hotel room is typically the worst experience that we have in a hotel. So we started trying to understand how do you engage in that experience and how do you understand the Equinox Hotels brand and understand Equinox gyms 
and look at, you know, they're a very provocative gym. They like people to look at each other. They're, it's a very sort of provocateur uh, experience when you go to their gyms. And we wanted to bring a bit of that into the uh, hotel, which they're just starting to build out now, and connect back to the city again. So we actually created these glass uh, walls into the rooms that you can, it's switch glass, you can turn it on or off so you can see through it or not see through it. So it allows you a little bit control of how you're actually interacting with that hallway and with other guests. What it also does is start framing out the city. So it draws a deeper connection with the city around you, ultimately providing some opportunity to tap into travel and tourism. And then we go into the whole, we actually build out the menus we build out what type of tea there is. We build out a whole narrative about how you enter into the lobby and you're provided tea and there's a scent of tea and the materials get laid onto that again. Again, you're starting to see a rhythm here. This is a private members club called Fittler Club in Philadelphia opening in February. Uh, it's 105,000 square feet that we're building out the full architecture, but we also go into designing glassware, tableware, all of the branding, all of the graphics that get laid on top of this and actually have a, well, Every time I go through the airport, they take these away. But if you want to, here's the scent for Fittler Club. So you guys can start smelling. Now, it's not that just open it and take a little smell if you like. You can pass around. I had 30 of them. Now there's one left after. This happens every time. I try to sneak them through, and it never works. Uh, so it doesn't, this doesn't have the same effect when you're sitting in a JW Marriott built 50 years ago with terrible lighting and awful chairs and it's a different experience. All of these things get tied together. And so we want to be very curious and careful about how scents and materials and furniture and lighting, all of these things go into our experience, right? Our experience would be very different if we were sitting, you know, in a very luxurious place by the pool talking about this today with the scent of the beach, right? You, you would think about what I'm saying in a very different way than you are now, whether it be better or worse. For me, it would be better. For you, I'm not so sure. But we go into actually designing the logos, the numbers, the details on the door. You see the logo now on the bottom of the, the number. All of this stuff gets reiterated into your memory sense. This is the fitness space. And these are some of the details, all custom uh, faucets, custom hardwood, custom water milled sinks, custom furniture. Again, this is the VR experience if we had the glasses. But yes, we still go all the way back to the full building as well. So details all the way up to the full building. But then we start looking at these other experiences, how to solve bigger problems. Can we fix airline food? The amount of sugar and salt in airline food right now is tremendous. And the reason why is because our taste buds don't work the same way at that altitude than they do at our normal altitude. And so we're trying to figure out a way to actually decant wine in a self-decanting wine glass but we go into the product, we go into the marketing of it. So all of this stuff, we control the whole process. Can we change the way people sit and actually engage people to actively sit and actually generate electricity while we're doing that? Can we help rheumatoid arthritis patients with a textured and larger grasp for their utensils because a lot of them have trouble squeezing to the extent that we do? This is a project, this is the last, I think, two projects now. This is called the Pink House. Some of you may have seen this before. We actually had over a, a, a million uh, mobile hits on this project within 24 hours. Now, we didn't really think this through, but we had four existing houses on a property that we were gonna build 45 units on. Okay, and so we came in, brought it an artist, painted it all pink in uh, basically less than a day, and the next morning we had five news trucks waiting outside wondering what was going on. And so we started a conversation about the city and about our project, and we have a wait list for the project before it was even started construction. So there's an integrated marketing here that is super valuable. And this is the project uh, that's under construction at the moment on that site. I'll just fly through these and then Sterling and I will have a quick chat. AutoCamp is another client we're working with. They're basically luxury glamping units. So I think this now starts to tie a little bit more to the uh, tapping into mobile disruption, actually, because AutoCamp is a technology company. They're not a real estate company. They are not a architecture company, not a design company. They've, they're built on the back of an application. 
But what they're trying to do now, and I'm not sure if it's really successful or not, is, is unroll basically 10 new properties in the next couple of years. So we're working on developing their luxury glamping units. At the moment, they use, um, they use existing units, and these are the ones that we're building for them in a factory now and rolling out next week in Yosemite, and then the other two sites I'll tell you about later. Project in Italy. And all this comes around mostly to allow us to design hopefully beautiful and provocative buildings that also get to layer into an actual understanding of how we sell these things. This is a spec home in Beverly Hills, 21,000 square feet, but without an integrated marketing and branding idea of how we were gonna sell this thing, we would have a very hard time because there's 120 houses being sold in the hills right now. So unless we have a brand advantage, it is very difficult for us to sell these houses. Yes, it looks unique, but we also have to get in the minds and get hopefully in the hearts of people that are gonna be buying this thing for a lot of money. So this is the pool. It's currently under construction, 100 foot long pool that's on the slope. And then this is the last project I'll go through. So this is Green Street, a seven story cannabis filled uh, building almost 70,000 square feet that we filled with all cannabis companies. Some of the best in the industry, we have a legal company, marketing, a spa, a 240 seat restaurant, and all cannabis related. And so obviously there's sort of an inherent opportunity for marketing there, but then we start going into really the details of the whole thing and start branding this each floor out so that each floor gets its own unique identity. And then when you lay them all together, again, it's something that really can't be copied, which is what we're going for as well. This is our custom bud bar where you learn how to roll a joint if you don't know how to roll one. Uh, it's water jet milled, but this kind of high level of design mixed with this sort of what we think of a lowbrow industry or what used to be is an interesting dichotomy of how we can really wrap a narrative around that as well. Again, we have a custom scent and no, it's not just smelling like marijuana, but and then each project we have now, we go through this rhythm. We design an icon, design a brand around that project, which is very unique for an architecture firm. So these are just some of the ones that, we've, that we're working on at the moment. And that is it. Sterling, you wanna have a little chat? Yeah, sure, sure. thank you, man. You always have such beautiful stuff. I'm like lost in the houses and the designs up there. That's I, the idea so that I, everyone forgets that I'm talking and then they can do right. that. Right, my God, I want that house. I only need a lot more zeros in my bank account, I think. Um, but what we thought we could do is, is have some conversation here because Matthew and I have done a bunch of stuff together and as you guys have questions, we'll kind of filter them in here. Uh, but what's great is how broadly you think about these things, right? It's not, oh, we're an architecture firm, or we need to create a mobile app, or we need to create a physical space. It's really holistic. And that's maybe, it's certainly not the norm, and it takes something to think that way. How'd you kind of start that route? Yeah, I think it was completely out of necessity, right? So architecture in general is a very tough industry, and people think of it in a sort of ephemeral way, it's exciting. I, I, everyone always wanted to be an architect, right? You talk to most people, I tell, oh, I always wanted to be an architect when I was four years old, when I was eight years old. I was like, yeah, sure you did, so did I. I was just, There's a know, good Seinfeld joke about uh, that, I, I think. Yeah, there is actually, yeah. I was just the <laughs> sucker who ended up getting into it and yeah. didn't do something else. But, you know, it's a, it's a tough industry in that architects are sort of thought about as the people who come in and design, we work a lot of hours, don't get paid a lot, which is what a lot of you do as well. There's just an associated, hopefully, paycheck or opportunity at the end of that that architects don't have. There's not, a, you know, architects get paid very poorly and there's not an opportunity to sell the company at the end of the day anymore. Although, you know, we, ultimately that's sort of where we'd like to go. But we've learned a lot from the tech industry about, and that's why I love coming to speak at these types of things because I can learn so much and hopefully we can now come back to this world and actually offer a little insight about extending our scope and really reducing the inefficiencies that are in our industry and probably a lot of others as well, I think. Yeah, it, it seems to me it's in the distinction of creating something 
as valuable, that you can actually make it valuable. You, you know, like you were saying, anybody can get an architecture degree, more or less. Mm -hmm. But it's in taking that degree and saying, okay, I'm going to do something special with this, not because somebody else can't do it, but because they're, they don't have the same mind as I do. They think differently about it. And that's valuable, right? Because you said. Yeah, and people don't think about architecture as an industry that you can disrupt. Yeah. They don't. I mean, every other industry is disruptible. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not a word. You're right. Uh, and for some reason, this industry is this maybe so old and so uh, rooted in history that we think that, okay, this is the pace it goes. This is how it has to be. But it's not, and I think it's just a huge opportunity right now to realize you know, the amount of liability that we take. I, I don't know how architects are surviving, and a lot of them aren't anymore. Yeah. And so I think you know, between all of you and us, if we start communicating in a much richer level and more frequently, there's a great opportunity for us to change cities, to change mobility, transportation. And some of the things that you guys were already talking about today, and I'm sure yesterday, that we're thinking about and working and actually know a lot about, right? We talk to neighbors and communities and try to understand how transportation works and look for transportation hubs for developments also. All of these things are so connected that unless all of us start talking more frequently, I think we're gonna miss a big opportunity. Yeah, I, I love the unit you designed with the living space and office space in the same building. and. Apple's got some of that philosophy with their like spaceship circular headquarters. Yeah. I'm sure you guys have all seen pictures of that, right? It's this gorgeous campus that they have in, in Cupertino. And the idea is that people can, you know, cross through the center of that circle. Yeah. How do you see kind of a existing community, right, like that, compared to how the outside can actually influence it? Because that seems very... Um, Insular? Insular, that's the word I was looking for. I almost said ancestral. Uh, yeah. Right, but, but at a certain point you get a group thing created inside of that circle. How do you continue to push the boundaries there? Yeah, I think the, you know, we have to be careful about those types of environments because they become mini urban centers that aren't sustainable, really. Uh, I think the goal there is to learn from Apple and the idea of this community. And hopefully people will work there and take ideas from there and actually bring them into an urban environment. Because the urban environment, yeah, it's a, it's a cyclical thing where people move to urban environments and then extract themselves into the, and get tired of it and move out to the farmland if there is any left soon. But, you know, Apple is pushing the boundary. Well, I guess most tech companies, large ones anyway, are pushing the boundary of how do we keep people there and keep them happy for as long as possible. But ultimately, you know, and people, or someone, uh, the talk, talk previous was just mentioning that, you know, people are working two, three jobs, some, some of the younger freelancers. It's gonna be harder and harder, I think, to keep people at Apple. And so, and that's a good thing, probably, because we want people to learn from them, but also then come into urban environment and actually learn from each other, I hope, similar to how we can learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. Lance was saying he, he had the picture of the future of work with that. I think it was a woman sitting out on a pier somewhere with her mobile yeah. connected computer, and, and this is what work's going to look like in, in the future. Yeah, that's what Apple is fighting. Yeah. Th thankfully. Right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's how we're thinking about these things that I, I think opens up so much opportunity because you're kind of exposing yourself to things that you're not familiar with with and you know that might be a good takeaway for everybody here is like well how do you take that group think that's inevitable right at a certain point you've talked to everybody not that new things can't come out of it but you're all kind of living in the same intellectual world and how do you start pushing the boundaries with that coming to conferences or bringing in different speakers and so on like that yeah i'm sort of curious to get if we can i mean there's not that many of you so we can <laughs> call you out at this point I, i'm really curious as to you know, your thoughts on, on branding your own companies. If there's a, is there some, I'm gonna try to learn from you now for a few minutes left. <laughs> is there something that I could take into architecture, design, development, all of this from you guys in terms of branding? How do you guys brand your companies? No, but not all at once here. 
<laughs> well, first of all, is it something you think about? Like, is, is brand top of mind? Maybe just raise your hand if it is. Yeah. And so how is it top of mind? Is it just kind of in the background or is there a brand guide or do you have conversations about it? How does that play into your day to day? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then how do you keep that going? Like how is there an opportunity for you to control it and enhance that brand? I guess, would you, or, or is that valuable to you, do you think? Do you think it's valuable to have a scent attached to your brand? At all. <laughs> I was thinking about that at Equinox too. I was like, ah, oh, the first smell that comes to mind is not pleasant. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And was there somebody else that raised their hand over here? Yeah. And you don't want them thinking about something else, right? Because the second they go on a tangent, then it's tough to get them back on the tracks. Yeah, yeah, extremely. Actually, I talked to a gentleman from DoorDash yesterday. I don't know if anyone was here before. No, okay. Uh, they they mentioned they had to increase their amount of people on the ground and their marketing teams and just physical people in more locations so that their drivers could actually go and talk to someone and access real people and real ideas and feel like they're part of something. And they said that the amount of engagement between customer interaction is so much stronger when they increase that amount, that they just kept rolling that out, right? So it's not as if we're getting, the, the digital platforms will be there and will change and evolve and there'll be more of them. But that doesn't mean that people in physical spaces will disappear. It actually means that we'll probably need more of them, which I think is this idea of retail is dying was a totally false statement that we're now starting to realize they're more important than ever. They're just changing into experiences instead of point of sale locations, right? You don't sell something in the store. You sell something when people go home and connect to your brand. And that's the whole point. You create a memorable experience for them with all of these layers. And then you guys do your work. And that point of sale is critical, but you needed a base for that to be as strong as it is. Yeah. And you said something really interesting around brand education. Because when I think of brand education, I'm like, oh, well, you need a YouTube video and somebody's got to explain what the brand stands for. And right up your alley is, well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that in your face. You can do it through design, you can do it through scent, you can do it through all these different mediums that are much more subtle where people are actually embodying what the brand's standing for versus telling them, right? Like, oh, I stand for these three things. Exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's where the value is now. It's all subtle layers of hints of things without telling people that they're being sold something, right? Which is what you guys do every day. You're selling something without selling it. Yeah. Any other questions? We've got time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Next question. Just kidding. Yeah.
the way that we're doing it is trying to tap all five senses. So once you tap all five senses, there's an inherent understanding that I think we're starting to learn. Typical smell is not involved with a lot of brands or products. It's starting to come into play, right? There's certain hotels that smell a certain way, certain stores smell a certain way, good or bad. People relate to that brand because of that smell, because of a touch, because of the way it looks. And ultimately, taste is going to come into play as well. And all of these things, whether we want them to or not, are layers of a brand that people will recognize and become that feeling. And that's how we're doing it. Awesome. Well, I could probably talk about this stuff all day, but thank you. Yeah, really great you. having you here. Until next time, huh? Thank you. <laughs>